It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans, and I'll be your host this morning. Appreciate you riding with us. If you were joining us live on our website, I'm glad to have you on board. Let's give a shout out to the folks over in Chesterfield. I'm not quite sure where Chesterfield is. <laughs> um, but. Um, there are a lot of folks that uh, come on in cities I'm not necessarily familiar with. Uh, just general idea of where they might be. Uh, I see folks out there in uh, Maine and Florida. I see Texas out there. I see Arizona out there. And I see, uh, let's see, that looks like it might be Tacoma, Washington. And I uh, see Chicago out there. And So thank you all for joining with us. I appreciate your, uh, your visiting with us on our, uh, live on our website. You know, we stream the program live every morning from 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. Central Time. And uh, we appreciate those who join us live for that version. Uh, Afterwards, we post that video up on YouTube so that uh, anyone who wants to capture it later can do so. So we appreciate uh, all of you who are um, are, uh, capturing us, whether whether you're doing so on on, um, our live site, on YouTube, on uh, Patriot FB. Uh, Patriot Facebook. And by the way, if you haven't become a member yet at Patriot FB, I strongly encourage you to do that. Not only is AVN up there, but there are a number of other great hosts up there, including J.J. McCartney and Tom uh, Lakarova and and and, uh, Jeff Norton. These guys all do radio programs there. You can stream a great um, uh, radio program there called Patriot Radio and Patriot FB Radio, and you can... um, listen to music in between the hosts and it's a great opportunity and a way for you to uh, stay in touch with other patriots there's no trolls allowed on patriot fb so if you're sick and tired of facebook and the nonsense over there make sure that you get away from there and get over to uh, patriotfb.com um, i want to talk this morning about kind of a theoretical issue and the reason i want to do that is because I want, to ta- I want to tackle the issue of some of the misconception, I think, that Americans have with what's happening around us. And when I say that, it's because we keep seeing all of these, you know, yesterday I was in, pretty, I was in a pretty sour mood. And I wanted to get to the TTP and, uh, TPP uh, treaty and, and go over the environmental aspects of that with you guys. And I didn't get a chance to do that because, frankly, I'm, I'm so frustrated at the lack of, of intent that I see in most Americans today about doing something. Because they use as an excuse the fact that, or, or, or the, the rationale, I should say, that, well, no one can really explain why this is happening or what's happening. And we don't really know what, you know, government's intentions are and all that, Right. We can't prove it, you know. Well, with all due respect, I've got to I've got to bring that back to a completely different perspective. And the reason that I say that is because it's time that we stopped waiting for some level of empirical proof to be produced by the people themselves who are the corrupted. In other words, you know, waiting for some Senate hearing to come out and say, okay, here's the, here's the, the empirical document, documentary proof is never going to resolve the problem. We're never going to see that, ladies and gentlemen, because these people are investigating themselves. And there's an old adage out there called Occam's Razor. I want to talk a little bit about it this morning. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a philosophical and scientific or theoretical principle. And basically, it's from a guy named William of Ockham, (laughs) who lived in 1287 to about 1350. 
And remember, people didn't live that long there, right? So, I mean, you know, he was in his 60s. And the principle is simply one which says that when you are looking at a situation and two or more theories are possible, the most likely answer is the one that requires the simplest level of explanation. So I want to evaluate what we're seeing going on in our nation today, utilizing that principle that when you are looking at any given situation and you're trying to evaluate or establish what is the truth, that given the various explanations that are available, the simplest one is almost always accurate. Now, to be fair, this isn't a hard and fast rule that applies in every instance. Because it's not, you know, it, it's, it's a theory, essentially. It's a heuristic uh, diagnostic tool and a discovery tool to guide in, in principle. But the idea is, if you, it, and, and it holds water, if you look at almost any situation you can see the application of Occam's razor. So, the idea of sitting there and taking multiple competing theories and trying to determine where the truth lies is almost invariably solved by saying that the simplest truth the most obvious truth, that that has the least number of conjecture principles assigned to it, is more than likely the most accurate. And when I look at things like the questions that I posed this morning up on americasvoicenow.org, Facebook and, and uh, Patriot FB and the other places where we post media, I posted up there a number of issues. One... Um, that the question has been whether or not the NSA has been spying on members of Congress. There was a hearing, a Senate hearing the other day, and they were flatly asked. Of course, they dogged around it and wouldn't really say. Now, this was a DOJ representative, and why a Department of Justice uh, assistant uh, district attorney is responding when these questions should be going directly to the feder to the uh, NSA heads is beyond my comprehension. But irrespective of that, they also asked whether or not the uh, the the uh president's phone information was also being collected. And you know, again, I got to say where two theories are possible, the one that is most likely is the one that requires the simplest explanation. And so the answer is, of course, yes, they are. There should be no question in anyone's mind as to whether or not that's the case. There was another article that I posted up this morning about how the NSA wiretapping has violated the attorney-client privilege. Now, you know, if you've never really been involved in legal issues in your life or what have you, you probably are not aware that the attorney-client privilege is, is sacred. It's sacro sacrosanct. It's the equivalent of the confessional in the sense that whatever you say to your attorney, once he has agreed to be your representative in a, in, in a court, he cannot, uh, for any reason, expose what you've, what you've discussed. And... The NSA, because of the fact that they're capturing all these phone calls, has, um, for all intents and purposes, violated that most sacred of principles in the, in the jurisprudence community. And the, the, the article basically states that there was a, a guy by the name of uh, Addis uh, Medun Janin, I, and I'm, I'm probably butchering his name and I apologize. But he called a guy by the name of Robert Gottlieb in, in 2009. Now, this is going back a few years, right? Here we are five years ago. And he basically spoke, uh, he was looking to hire an attorney. 
Gottlieb was the attorney. So over the six months that, that moved forward, Gottlieb agreed to, his, to take this guy's case. And the guy basically told the lawyer that he thought he needed legal representation because he may be under investigation. And over the next six months, they had 42 telephone calls. Now, you may say, well, how do they know? Well, remember that attorneys use billable, billable time, right? So they log all their phone calls and they log the time and how long they're on there. In fact, I've, I've known attorneys in my life who actually have almost like a chess clock on their desk. And when that phone call comes in, they slap that chess clock and they begin to record the time. They bill you in six minute increments and what have you. Some attorneys do, some don't. Anyway, over the course of six months, they had 42 phone calls together. So ultimately this guy, uh, Medin Janin, uh, was arrested in January of 2010. So again, we're still talking four years ago, right? And he was arrested on charges that he tried to bomb the New York subway. So Gottlieb was the guy who was going to defend him, and he obtained security clearance to go in and do what's called discovery. Now, in a criminal case, discovery says that the, the government has to produce all of the evidence that they're going to use in a trial against you, and that you have an op opportunity to see all the evidence that they're going to use so that you can produce some sort of a legitimate valid defense. And that means if they've got witnesses that they're going to, to bring forth who are going to testify that you know they saw you do this or heard you do that or whatever the case may be, that you know what those witnesses, who they are, number one. And number two, any other documentary or, or evidence that they may have, including physical evidence and what have you. The process of discovery is clearly outlined for everyone to understand. And so the idea is that it makes for a fair case. By the way, the defense has to also provide discovery to the government so that the government knows that you intend to provide you know, a witness who will say, well, no, he wasn't there. He was, he was with me in a restaurant or whatever the case may be. Right? So you're required to produce your evidence. They're required to produce their evidence. So anyway... In this case, because it was a national security case and this guy was accused of bombing a subway, the attorney had to get and receive special security clearance to review the government documents. And so he went over to the, to the place where the, uh, the documentation was held and the, and the evidence was held, and he had to um, go into this secured room, and he had to gain access through a secret security code. He had to open a filing cabinet that was also locked down and secured, and in the second draw was a CD. Well, when he listened to the CD, there were recordings on the CD of every one of the 42 phone calls that he had had with his client before the guy was actually arrested in January of 2010. In other words, for the, for the six months preceding his arrest, every phone call that they had made was recorded not the metadata, but the actual physical phone call. Now, for the record, what you have to realize is that those phone calls are the equivalent of having a recording device in the confessional at church. Ladies and gentlemen, when you ask, is the NSA monitoring Congress and listening to their phone calls? Is the NSA monitoring the president and listening to his phone calls? The answer is, of course, they are. And when you wonder why, I throw this out there to you. In fact, uh, well, let me, let me just simply say it this way. If you apply the principles of Occam's razor, there is no other explanation. In other words, to explain the behavior of Congress of the past, over the course of the past um, couple of years, frankly, more, more likely the last 20, but with, with vigor over the past 10, there is no other explanation 
other than the fact that they've been compromised. The behavior, the voting, the actions of Congress can be explained by no other rational explanation. I don't care how many theories you can come up with. If you follow Occam's razor, where multiple two or more theories are possible, the most likely answer is the one that requires the simplest explanation. And in this case, the testimony was pretty clear. The National Security Agency, quote, probably collects phone records of members of Congress and their staffs. That was the statement of a senior Justice Department official when he had this interview on two, when he had this testimony on Tuesday. He's the Deputy Attorney General. His name is James Cole. And he was pressed quite hard. In fact, the article says buckled under questioning from multiple lawmakers during a House Judiciary Committee hearing, which was reviewing proposals to reform the NSA spy. Zoe Lofgren, who's a California Democrat, and by the way, uh, for those of you that are ideologically bent and, and biased one way or the other, I got to tell you that it's the Republicans in this case, in the NSA spying and all of the monitoring and surveillance that's going on in the country, who are your enemy here. It is not the Democrats. The Democrats are the ones who are actually stepping up to the plate and attempting to put some semblance back into the law and order concept of law and order. So uh, for those of you that are, are um, not willing to accept the principles of critical thinking, that you need to look at all aspects and then make a decision based on objectivity, you're making a mistake here. Zoe Lofgren, a California Democrat, asked Peter Swire. Now, Swire is a member of the presidential committee that was designed and handpicked by the president, remember now. And I did a previous program about this in which I, I outlined and, and went over each of the individuals that was elected here to or appointed by the president to do this surveillance review system. And Swire was one of the members. And he was asked whether or not they are monitoring Congress themselves. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that Congress would ask that question because <laughs> they got to be worried about what the heck they've been doing over the past decade when they didn't know any of this was happening, right? But they were, uh, he was asked whether the lawmakers' numbers are included in the agency's phone record sweeps. And Swire, of course, was trying to wiggle, wiggle his way out of this. He didn't really want to answer the question for obvious reasons. And he protested that he was not a government official and he couldn't best answer the question but said that he was unaware of the mechanism that would scrub out member phone numbers from the list. So then Issa got up, Daryl Issa, Issa, however you say his name, and he said, and he got a little bit more pointed. He said, Mr. Cole, do you collect area code 202-225 and the four digit afterwards in each of those two phone exchanges? And the answer from Cole was, we probably do, Mr. Congressman, but we're not allowed to look at any of those. However, unless we have, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to look at any of those, however, unless we have reasonable, articulable suspicion that those numbers are related to a known terrorist threat. Okay, so let's evaluate his statement there. First of all, he's supposed to be an independent person who was appointed by the president to look at the, the surveillance issue and render some recommendations back to the president about what was right or wrong with the program and what could be done to correct it. The report that ultimately they came back with was quite scathing, if you recall. But more importantly, what he says, what he says here is very, very, very important. And I'm surprised that the, that the uh, author of this article didn't pick that out. Notice how he refers to themselves, to, to how he refers to the NSA. We probably do, Mr. Congressman. But we're not allowed to look at any of those, however. 
In other words, he's now putting himself in the same position and in the same company as the NSA. Now, with all due respect, you cannot be both a member of the NSA and the body who is doing all of this collection and be an independent, objective member of the president's review board at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a conflict of interest. And why that's not being pointed out is beyond my understanding. Other than the fact that you have to apply the principle of Occam's razor. And that principle says, where multiple theories are possible, the one that most likely is accurate or truthful is the one that requires the simplest explanation. What we have is a government that has gone completely over the edge and no longer even, they're cavalier now. Cavalier in their willingness to flaunt and flagrantly break the law. All right, we're going to take a break. Before we go to break, I want to thank our friends over at uh, Express Mini Mart 1 and 2. Express Mini Mart 2 is up on the corner of 14 and 63 in Old Granny's Cafe. It used to be the Old Granny's Cafe building. They have uh, the vapory cigarette and tsunami vaporizer fluids. They've got a, a huge uh, ice uh, cave in there for beer. Uh, they've got liqueur and wine coolers as well and things like that. They've got snacks and chips and hot food, uh, lottery tickets, and the lowest priced soft drinks that you can find. Uh, 39 cents and up. Make sure that you get in to see those folks. They also have a drive through in both locations. Their other location is directly across the street from the pool in, in uh, West Plains, in the city of West Plains, right across from People's Park, and that one is called Express Mini Mart 1. So make sure that you get in there. They don't have liquor and alcohol in, the, in one. they only in two. But make sure that you get in there and you see those folks. They have a special on that uh, vaporizer fluid, five for one. Get, buy five, get one free. So make sure that you see those folks and that you uh, let them know that you appreciate them sponsoring America's Voice Now because that's how we stay on the air. Make sure that you see our friends over at the Battery Station. You can find them on the web by going to batterystation.com. You can also call them at 417-257-7799. And also, please make sure that you reiterate to them that you've heard about them on, on AVN and you appreciate their work. Uh, you can find our friends over at Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard. You can go up to the manager, Bruce, there and let him know that as well. They have a, uh, a special salad bar that uh, is available during the day from 11 to 11.30 to uh, 1.30 or 11 to 1.30. And um, please avail yourself of that as well as the pizza bar and the pasta bar. And uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they have a special $5 day, which is a reduced price lunch. On Tuesday evenings, they have Kids Eat Free at Family Night under 12 years old. Make sure that you avail yourself of that. Jason Henry over at number 10 Court Square in West Plains handles uh, criminal, civil, and um, matrimonial issues, both state and federal, 417-256-4100. Our friends over at Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop, they are on the square in West Plains, 417-257-1776. And then make sure that you swing into Wits End Classic Barbershop and get yourself a haircut. I was going to go there yesterday, but it snowed. So I might try to make it by there today. We'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to America's Voice now. Please ride with us for the morning. We'll be right back. video guy makes fun of me whenever I do that. All right. That's about as radio voice as I can get. I don't know how guys do that. <laughs> but they do. Um, let's just touch on a couple of things here. You know, this, this topic uh, for this segment here is going to be about eminent domain. And how... When the court approves tyranny, that's no excuse to declare it to be accurate or right or legitimate or anything else. 
And the reason I say that is because when you look at when you look at Supreme Court decisions, um, just because the court has made a determination and a decision about something doesn't make it right or legitimate. In fact, if we follow the principles that were given to us by our founders, they declared unequivocally that that was not the case. In other words, Jefferson basically came right out and said, if just because the court makes a determination, they are not the final arbiters of the Constitution because they are in a position where they are in a conflict of interest. In other words, they work themselves and are appointed by and paid for by the same government that they are supposed to be objectively ruling over or casting a ruling upon. And when you look at the concept of how you can have um, a court that is or, or could possibly be objective, they can't be in a, in, in a, in a situation where they have a fiduciary responsibility to their employer while maintaining an equal fiduciary responsibility to the person who's in front of them. The problem, and, and what we start, what, what, what's prompting this, is an article that I found this morning, which I thought was very, very important to, to look at. And that is the, the case of where eminent domain was originally approved by the court in a five to four decision. Now, this is an article out of the Weekly Standard, and this was the case that actually broke the back of the general public with regard to eminent domain. So let me, let me explain first and foremost what eminent domain is for those of you that don't know. And if, if you know, you're one of those lawyerly types and you know exactly what it means or you've got a history or a real estate background, you just have to forgive the, the elementary explanation. But eminent domain is the principle where government can step in and take your property from you. They have to pay you some level of remuneration, but they can take your property from you based on the, the benefit that would be derived by society or the community in general. And in this case, this, where this actually took place was on, in Connecticut, and it was on a river, and the city wanted this 90-acre parcel and there were homes all over this property and they uh, went in there and said okay we're going to kick you all out of here because we're going to raise this neighborhood raise it as in destroy it and they were going to create economic development that would for all intents and purposes raise the value of the property from a taxation perspective or what have you and there were some people that pushed back and said, well, wait a minute now, these are our homes. I mean, you don't have the right to do that. And when we look at it in the context of, as an example, the Ozark Scenic National Riverways, in the 60s, when the, when the federal government was ceded the land by the state of Missouri, the federal government came to Missouri and they said, here's what we're going to do. You've got this beautiful rivers or series of rivers. There's actually a couple of them that are part of it. It's Jack's Forks and, and other rivers. It's not just a river. It's a group of them. And they're in Shannon and, and other counties. But basically, they're, they're pristine rivers. And the state owned a lot of land around them. But there was no federal land around them. And then there were private landowners that lived right on the river themselves. And the, many of those whole... Many of those were original homesteads that were 150, you know, 175 years in the family, right? And so the federal government came in and said to the state of Missouri, here's what we've decided. We're going to, you're either going to give this property to us and we're going to turn it into a national park called the Ozark Scenic Riverways National Park, or we're going to 
have the Army Corps of Engineers come in here and build a dam and flood it all. So they obtained, So the state of Missouri looked at it and said, okay, well, we'd prefer to have it as a river than flood it in a giant reservoir because we already have quite a few of those around here. And I'm, I'm speaking about this Ozark Scenic uh, Riverways because it's right in my backyard, and it's a fight we're fighting right now against the federal government. <laughs> and essentially, the government... The state uh, uh, relented and said, okay, we're going to give the property over to the federal government, which is really what they wanted. They didn't really want to flood it. They wanted the property. They wanted to turn it into a national park. But because the state wouldn't be cooperative, they basically held a gun to their head and said, if you don't give us this money, or this property, we're going to flood it and make it useless to you, which is essentially the scorched earth mentality of government. If you can't, if we can't have it, nobody can have it, right? Sounds kind of like the abusive husband in a relationship. You know, I don't, I don't want her, and I beat the heck out of her daily. But if I can't have her, nobody can have her kind of mentality, right? Well, in this case, the state turned the property over to the federal government. They called it the national parks. Uh, the national parks called it the Ozark Scenic Riverways and, you know, so forth and so on. They went in. And through eminent domain, removed all the owners of all the property on both sides of the river that was on the river itself and built this buffer zone that had a setback away from the river for whatever it was, a quarter of a mile, half a mile, whatever, to keep the river, quote, pristine. Now, many of those landowners didn't really want to leave. In fact, these were their family homesteads that had been in their homes and in their families and for generations and hundreds of years in some cases. And yet they weren't given a choice. Government utilized and abused its police power to force them out. Now, in the case here in Connecticut, there was a woman who went and filed a court case against this, and her name was Kelo, K-E-L-O. And it was the city of New London, Connecticut. And the case was filed back in 2005, when it finally made it to the Supreme Court. And she lost. The city was given the right, and the high court declared, based on its majority ruling, that, quote, economic development could involve and should involve using eminent domain as a methodology and a means to transfer private property from the hands of a private owner to an economically, quote, ambitious property owner. In other words, if you're... If you own the property, but there's a developer who wants to build a hotel there that would generate economic development and value for the city or for the county or the community, that their rights supersede yours. Wow. One would look at that, and in a normal course of events, in a, in a, a republic would say, that's not the role of government. The role of government is to protect the smallest minority. The minority of one. In other words, government, you know, the difference between a republic and, and a, and a, a uh, democracy, which, by the way, you, you'll, you'll never hear any politician ever use the word republic. They all say, well, in our democracy, this is not a democracy, it's a republic. The difference is significant, ladies and gentlemen. In a democracy, the majority rules on everything. And there is no individualized protection for the smallest minority of the one. So, essentially, if there are ten people sitting there, and eight of them get together and say, it's legal for us to take your stuff, it's legal for them to take your stuff. I mean, to take it to a ridiculous extreme, if seven of them were to say it's legal for us to make murder would be legal, that theoretically murder would be legal. There is no protection for the one, the small minority, the individual. And yet we know that in the infinite wisdom of, of the founders, they looked at this concept early on and said, That can't be. We can't have that. And the simplest solution to that is to create this bill of 10 
this Bill of Rights of 10 specifically outlined uh, things that are unalienable, not because government decrees that you have these, but because the, you have them as, an, as a foundational function of your, of your living, breathing sentience, your being itself. Just the fact that you're an, a live human being gives you the right to free speech, the right to worship a god of your choosing in any way and shape and form that you believe is appropriate for you that you have the right to self-defense and that you have the right to defend your nation and your community, your state, and so forth and so on. That you have the right not to have in the Third Amendment, which many people don't even know what the Third Amendment says, but that the government doesn't have the right to, to house soldiers in your home and, and take your possessions to feed and house and clothe them. The Fourth Amendment, where you have the ability and the wherewithal to say, my personal information, my privacy, my, the, the items in my home and my papers and my effects are protected from a police state who would seek to gain access to them without probable cause or some explanation, some quantification that says, I've done something wrong in the first place, at which point you waive your right. I mean, if you're a criminal and you've robbed a bank and they've got your face on camera waving a gun around, and they say, there's probable cause that this guy is the guy, then they have the right because you've given up your Fourth Amendment. You've waived your right by your actions. Your Fifth Amendment right that says you cannot be forced or coerced to testify and incriminate yourself, to testify against yourself. Your Sixth Amendment right to a trial by jury of your peers so that we don't have a tribunal scenario where you've got a judge who's making a decision who's corrupted or corruptible. Ah, then wouldn't administrative law be a violation of the Constitution? Because in administrative law, there's no jury that hears your case. It's only a judge. Didn't know that, did you? You see, these, these, this Bill of Rights was determined to be a way to protect the individual, the one, the smallest minority, against the whims of the majority. When the majority is swayed by emotion or swayed by stupidity, or swayed by ineptitude or apathy. And a majority is gained. 51% are active and 49% are asleep and say, it's okay for us to come in and take your stuff. The government's functional role is to protect and defend that smallest of minorities, the one. The Supreme Court I might add, follows that same principle. In other words, just because a majority of five out of the nine justices determine that it's okay to violate your individual rights doesn't make it right. In fact, if you look at it from that perspective, that's what the Constitution is designed to prevent. The majority acting against the interests, the best interests of the minority of the one. So not only does it hold true in a larger societal picture, it also holds true in a court ruling situation. Just because the majority say it so doesn't make it so. Now, when we look at what our founders have said to us in reference to these issues, it's clear that their intention was that the United States of America would never be subjected to the rule of the majority and its whims, which bend with the wind. I mean, think about it for a moment. There have been times when the United States of America has been subjected to very foolish things. I, I, and, and, and was shortly repealed thereafter when the mistake was obviously made. A perfect example would be prohibition. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are some out there who would say prohibition you know, was a good thing. 
But the vast majority of America, um, you know, didn't agree with that, and that's why it was ultimately repealed. Now, again, limiting your ability to have access to alcohol by a constitutional amendment is no more fair or no more appropriate than would be saying it's okay to commit murder. And the majority says so. You have a right to drink if you so choose to. There are many, 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 many of us who will have one beer, a glass of wine from time to time with dinner. That doesn't make us an alcoholic. It doesn't make us a criminal. It doesn't make us a sinner. And it's inappropriate for anyone to impose their beliefs upon you to the point where they can say, because I say alcohol is bad, you can't have any. Now, <clears throat> when we take this one step further and we, we look beyond even these examples, we see the 17th Amendment, a perfect example. Some of you now are saying, well, what exactly was the 17th Amendment again? <laughs> okay. The 17th Amendment was the one that said that senators are no longer appointed by the state legislatures, but are now elected identically to the representative in the House by a vote of the people. Eh, mistake. Remember the principle of what that concept came on, how that came about. If you read, and, and the, the people who voted and approved the 17th Amendment, if they had read the original writings of our founders, they would have known that the founders clearly defined the system of representatives elected by the people and, senates and senators elected and appointed by the House and the Senate of the state legislature, the assemblies. Why? Well, for a very clear reason. First of all, having both a senator and a House of Representatives member elected by the general population, the general electorate, was overlap. In other words, the House member is the one who's closest to the people because they're in relatively small districts. And having both senators and elected representatives is an exact duplication. And that makes no sense. Secondarily... When you talk about a highly populous state, how many times have you actually even met your senator in, per in person other than when they're running for re-election? You don't. They don't come to your town hall meetings. They send a representative because they're too busy to hear the peasantry. So what you have is now the states have no representation. And that is where the Tenth Amendment began to fall apart. You see, the concept was that senators would act on the state's best interests while the House of Representatives would act on the best interests of the people generally at large on a federal level. Voila. The magic and the perfection of the system that we had was destroyed by the 17th Amendment, which said no longer is the, is the state legislature going to appoint a senator. Because as, as a result of that, two things have occurred. One, states have no representation. Therefore, the 10th Amendment was essentially voided. Secondarily, when you take away the ability for state legislatures to go and grab a congressman by the scruff of the neck and drag them back home and say, excuse me, what is it you think you're doing over there? Because you're not doing and voting in a way that represents and protects the best interests of the state of X. Get it? Perfect example. In Missouri, where I reside, Claire McCaskill went and voted for Obamacare even though a state election or a state ballot measure had determined that 72% of the states said, we don't want it. The answer was 72% of the states said, we don't want Obamacare. This is before it was voted upon by the Senate and the House. 72%. Now, let's be candid. That's a pretty significant majority. 
And a representative is supposed to, for all intents and purposes, not substitute their greater wisdom for your peasant, peon, no good, you know, small world view. They are supposed to act in concert with what the, the electorate is requesting. And 72% is a pretty strong electorate showing. And yet Claire went out there and voted on uh, or voted for Obamacare in direct contravention and in direct opposition to 72% of the state. Now, at that point in time, were the uh, 17th Amendment not passed, the state uh, assembly would have had an opportunity to reach out into Washington and grab Claire McCaskill by the scruff of her silk blouse dragged her back home, put her in front of a tribunal of state representatives and senators and said, you are fired. Furthermore, you were given a direct order not to vote for that, and so we're now charging you with criminal malfeasance. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole concept of accountability was voided by the 17th Amendment. There is no accountability. Find a, a senator who is accountable to their state and their, and their people. Find one. You can't. They don't exist. And I go back to the earlier example we did in segment one of Occam's Razor. Have they been compromised? Of course they have. Because when you have two competing theories, the one that makes the most sense is the one that has the least possible complications. And you cannot justify the actions of the House and the Senate. You cannot justify the actions of senators who, who vote against the best interests of their own people in their own states, and they're quite frankly their own families, unless you look at the simple explanation that they've been compromised, co-opted, or coerced in some way. And when you look at a scenario where, like in Kilo, that the court comes out and says, we as a majority believe that it's okay for the state or the federal government or anyone else to utilize and abuse its police power so that we can take property away from one person to give it to a crony or someone who is lobbied or bribed the government to obtain a piece of land so that they can build a hotel or a strip mall you kind of get the idea here. Okay, we're down to one minute left. Make sure that you visit our friends over at Express uh, Mini Marts 1 and 2. Uh, over uh, one is up on 63 and 14 at Old Granny's Cafe. Uh, make sure that you see the other one or straight across the street from People's Park in West Plains. Uh, discount tobacco products and uh, all kinds of chips and snacks and hot food and normal stuff you'd find in a Mini Mart. Make sure that you see our friends over at the uh, Wits End Classic Barbershop where you can get a great haircut for 10 bucks. He even does the old style hot lather straight razor shaves. Uh, treat your husband or your significant other or your boyfriend to that as, a, as a, a gift for birthday or maybe Valentine's Day. Wouldn't that be a wonderful Valentine's Day present? While you're there, swing into the Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop and buy him a nice cigar or if he smokes a pipe, you can get him a pipe, some fancy tobacco. Uh, anything along those lines, maybe an accessory that he would utilize for his uh, smoking. Also, while you're there, if you've got a legal case that requires assistance, you can visit the law offices of Jason Henry at number 10 Court Square in West Plains, Caddy Corner. And you can find him uh, by going to his uh, or, or calling his phone number at 417-256-4100. 417-256-4100. Very good attorney. Make sure that you see our friends at Pizza Hut. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they have a special for lunches. Uh, and every day they have a, a, a salad bar and pizza bar. Make sure that you get in there and see them. And then our friends at Battery Station at BatteryStation.com, 417-257-7799. We'll be back in just a moment, and we're going to hack the TPP.
It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. All right. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice right here, right now. You're joining us in the middle of our uh, program. We are on the third of four segments. And... um, we do this and, and follow this kind of uh, um, outline every day in which uh, I basically try to find four different topics that we can spend about 20 minutes on each one and get a little bit more in depth than what you would ordinarily hear or see or, or obtain in, in a news format. The reason I, I, I do it that way is because the role of AVN, America's Voice Now, and my job is really not to give you I mean, there's plenty of sources of news out there, both alternative and mainstream. I disagree with what most of the mainstream media does because I believe that they are, for all intents and purposes, propagandists. I call them the Ministry of Propaganda, in fact, or the MOP. The MOP is not interested in giving you truth. They're interested in giving you their particular slant and bias and in indoctrinating you, misleading you, and misrepresenting the realities of the world so that you can be herded mentally, physically, spiritually, psychologically. The alternative media, on the other hand, actively works to try to expose what the mop refuses to talk about. But even some of the Ministry of Propaganda um, principles have overflown, or overflowed, I should say, into the alternative media. And in some cases, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between the alternative media and the Ministry of Propaganda. In some cases, the alternative media is actually very self-serving. They're more interested in talking about those things that will help them, that individual host or or guest or whatever, earn a living or personal ego push or aggrandizement or whatever the case may be. We try to avoid all of that. There's a couple of different ways that we try to do that. One, we don't sell anything. I don't have, I've not written some book. I'm not pitching it. Um, we live purely and exclusively on donations from our listenership. I very, very rarely make a pitch for money. Uh, once in a while, I, I, I got to throw it out there, but I mean, we, you know, there is no income here other than the donations of listeners. The advertisers who advertise with us essentially pay the bills to keep us on the air in terms of radio the, the cost of what it costs to be on a radio station. You buy airtime on radio stations, folks. I'm not big enough for them to say, yeah, we want to carry him and we'll pay him. So any money that comes in from advertisers goes straight to pay bills. I don't take a salary. I never have. I've never been paid. And so the idea is we don't want to pollute and corrupt our message by turning this into a for-profit enterprise because once we do that, then we're no longer about telling the truth, and we're more interested in whether or not our advertiser says, hey, wait a second, I can't advertise with them because he's making a statement that's too controversial, and therefore I can't have that as part of my business. Frankly, if one of our advertisers doesn't like something I say and they want to leave, have a nice day. If, if one of our advertisers were to say to me, I can't, I can't advertise with you because of something that you said. You, you use the word treason or you use the word tyranny, and, I, and I'm too politically correct for that. Well, first of all, they wouldn't probably be one of our advertisers, but the truth of the matter is I would say to them, well, then have a nice day because if you think that I'm going to stop using that word, you're misinformed. So the concept of the alternative media and what its power is is pretty significant in the sense that I don't think a lot of folks realize just how uh, important it is that we have a method or a group outside of the Ministry of Propaganda that's pitching us. I took this concept of the, of the TPP treaty, which is the, uh, um, the uh, 
was exposed by WikiLeaks. This is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Treaty. And this is a treaty that is currently in negotiation by 12 countries and the United States of America. For the record, these countries account for about 40% of the global GDP. 40%, that's a pretty significant amount. And it's between these countries which, which are creating this um, idea of a globalized uh, treaty for trade. What they don't tell you is that they do it under the guise of trade, but there's a lot more in this than just trade. And what bothers me about this is that the TPP has been in, in negotiations now for five years. These negotiations have been kept silent and secret for all of those five years. In fact, it's so secret that Congress has not been allowed to see it. You're kidding me, right? No, I'm telling you the truth, ladies and gentlemen. In five years, 26 separate chapters dealing with various aspects of trade have been negotiated by multinationals, multinational conglomerate corporations, and the heads and the trade ent entities of these 12 given governments. They've not allowed Congress to see it, even though Congress must, by constitutional requirement, or at least the Senate, must vote on every treaty. And they have to ratify a treaty before it's applicable across the country. Now, they've, be they've been told by the administration, who is the... the uh, leader, if you will, of this particular boondoggle, that the president wants what's called fast-track authority on this particular treaty and another one called the TTIP. And let's just focus on the TTP for a moment, because, or the TPP treaty for a minute. I don't want to get into the TTIP for a minute, because it, it, there's, there are two different things. And one, the TTIP deals with the European Union, and it's more of a merger of, our, of the United States politically and economically than this one. This is a trade pact. But they're both labeled trade, but the truth is there's so little trade involved in them uh, in, in terms of the, the, the aspects of how you would look at trade that um, they're really... It's a, it's a mask, and it's a false mask, because what's underneath it is far, far more dangerous. These are implementations of the principles of Agenda 21, globalization, and the loss of sovereignty and the end of national borders and nationalism and the concepts of uh, individual countries having their own sovereign law. The idea behind both of these treaties, but the TPP and is what we're going to focus on this morning, is that multinational tribunals will be formed, which will have responsibility to make determinations about what and whom and how these rules and laws are honored and, and by each individual signatory country. And in this case... <clears throat> This particular chapter was obtained surreptitiously by WikiLeaks. Now, why, why a chapter, and there's two chapters that have been captured by WikiLeaks. We're going to talk about this one today, which is the environmental chapter. Why this had to be surreptitiously obtained by WikiLeaks when it's going to make all of us subjected to its, its parameters is beyond me. Why Congress is prohibited from seeing it when they've actually got a vote on it, or at least the Senate does, tells me that there's something desperately wrong. It's another of the Pelosi moments of we've got to pass it to see what's in it mentality. And in this case, WikiLeaks obtained this, and I don't know how they got it, and I don't really care. But I've poured over it, and I've done some homework on it, and I've looked at some of the parameters that are associated with it, and I've read between the lines and utilized some critical thinking skills to try to identify what the issues are surrounding this. Now, this particular one is 23 pages. And basically, it covers environment and environmental law. And this particular version is dated November 24th, and it was released by WikiLeaks on January 15th. So it's only two weeks old. I got a copy of it. I printed it out, and I read through the entire thing. 
And what they're talking about here is uh, restricting, restricting access and, and, and well, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Environmental law, for the purposes of this chapter, and it's a definitions section, environmental law means any statute or regulation of a party. And I want you to listen for the next two segments as we talk about this because it's important that you understand this is a legal document and we're being bound by it. So in other words, when we talk about things where we're bound by it and the words shall and may are used, this is a contract. And we're making our nation a party to it. So what's in it is critically important because it's what we're agreeing to forevermore. And the idea that this can be negotiated in secret and kept and withheld from Congress, who's actually got to ratify it, and withheld from the American people so that we could have some input with our, our senators and say we want it or don't want it, is unconscionable. Furthermore, to give the president what's called fast-track authority, and you'll hear that term used, to give the president fast-track authority means that he can put it up for a vote, and it cannot be amended. Now, the reason for that is simple. He doesn't want it amended because it means that five years' worth of negotiations would be tossed down the, down the bowl. In other words, he can't go back and say, okay, the Senate has ratified it, but they say you've got to pull out lines 1 through 68, 67 through 211, blah, 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 blah. So he's pushing for what's called fast-track authority, which means that you can either vote yes or you can vote no. But you can't vote no subject to this or yes subject to some changes. With all due respect, if this was negotiated in secret and Congress has never been given a look at it, and then they're ordered to vote for it without any modification, don't you smell a rat somewhere in there? Isn't there something desperately wrong with an agreement that will require us to lose our legal standing and our sovereignty, to turn over our sovereignty to an international tribunal, for our courts to no longer be in control of our law, for our Congress to not be in control of our law anymore, because these tribunals make the law, and Congress has essentially co-opted itself out of existence. Who would do such a thing? And why? This particular chapter deals with the prevention, abatement, or control of the release, discharge, or emission of pollutants or environmental contaminants, the control of environmentally hazardous or toxic chemicals, substances, materials, and wastes, and the dissemination of information related thereto, or the protection or conservation. Oh boy, when you hear the word conservation and protection regarding wild flora or fauna, including endangered species, their habitat and specially protected natural areas. They define specially protected natural areas as defined by the party in its legislation. So what that means is that in the United States, a specially protected natural area would be whatever the, the United States defines it as. It's defined differently in Australia or in Brunei or in, Cal in Canada or in wherever. But we have plenty of these um, specially protected natural areas in the United States that are subject to an awful lot of contention, don't we? In fact, that's one of the reasons why California is in the worst drought they've had in 100 some odd years. So the countries, by the way, that are a part, of, a part and party to this contract, for the record, are the United States, Japan, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Malaysia, Chile, Singapore, Peru, and Vietnam, New Zealand, and Brunei Darussalam. And in addition to that now, uh, Obama's been negotiating China into the agreement, which would jump this from about 40% of global GDP to about 60 or 65% of global GDP. Okay, so for the record, I've gone through this, and I've just made some marks and underlines, and I'll try to explain to them. Now, I'm going to have to take this out of context, because I don't have time to read you the entire thing. We're, we're down to nine minutes in this segment, and we're going to have another 20 in the next segment. But for the record, the objectives of this is, is outlined here, and the objectives of this chapter are to promote mutually supportive trade and environment po policies, promote high levels of environmental protection, and effective enforcement of environmental law, 
and enhance the capacity of the parties to address trade-related environmental issues, including through cooperation. So when I, when I hear words like this, this scares the pants off of me. Because first of all, we're talking about passing environmental law, right? And we're talking about promoting high levels of environmental protection and effective enforcement of environmental law. Here's the problem. They're not our laws. They are the laws of an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy of foreigners who would make us subject to their rulings. It's insane, ladies and gentlemen. No one of intellectual honesty, no one of national respect for our own independent sovereignty as a nation would even consider agreeing to these terms. Now, if you're a country and you don't really have any national sovereignty in the first place, well, that's your problem. But we do, and we shouldn't be willing to give it up. Let me rephrase that. We are not willing to give it up. And irrespective of what this president or this Congress does, if they approve this TPP treaty, if they give this president fast-track authority and it does get ratified, along with the Second Amendment, the, 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 uh, Second Amendment, the UN treaty that they tried to push through a little while ago. Let me tell you something. Approval of these treaties is a declaration of war against the American people, and we should respond and react as such. In the event, now, for the record, the, the Senate refused and rejected the Second Amendment uh, treaty, that, the small arms treaty that they tried to shove down our throats a couple months, or for the past year, essentially, through the UN. But mark my words, had the Senate, and, it, and it, only, it only failed by three votes, folks. Three votes. Three. Now, had the Senate approved that, it would have been time for a second civil war in the United States of America. And I would have come out on the air and recalled for one. Oh, I know, the NSA is all a flutter right now. Oh, <laughs> we got him, boy. The truth is, if you were to sit there and say that the Second Amendment is subject to the United Nations decision-making and rule-making, you have essentially declared open warfare on the United States of America. And we would respond and should respond appropriately with conflict. Make no mistake about it. Where we're headed and where this is all taking us is a complete and utter capitulation of everything that this country was built, designed, and founded upon. No more independent sovereignty, no more borders. That's why they don't care about the border, folks. Because this, part of this agreement is with Mexico, and this is only one chapter of 26. They don't care because we're in the process of creating the North American Union, which is a merger of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Don't believe me? Fine. That's your problem for being thick-headed and refusing to see and utilize critical thinking skills to take and, ga and calculate all of the available evidence before you make a determination and decision. <clears throat> the second objective is taking account of their respective national priorities and circumstances. The parties recognize that enhanced cooperation to protect and conserve the environment and, quote, sustainably manage their natural resources. When you hear phrases like that, folks, it's time to get alarmed. Bring benefits which can contribute to sustainable development, strengthen their environmental governance, and complement the objectives of the TPP. Wow. So, essentially, it is the national priority of the United States for us to enhance cooperation that will strengthen environmental governance and complement the objectives of the TPP, which is complete and total evisceration of state sovereignty, states meaning the whole United States of America, and to conserve the environment and sustainably manage natural resources contributing to sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the implementation of Agenda 21 without calling it Agenda 21, just this chapter alone. Because they actually later on go out and tell you that sustainable development is defined 
by the United Nations ISSC, which is Agenda 21. <laughs> and it's amazing. They're doing a backdoor run. The third objective is the parties further recognize that it is inappropriate to set or use their environmental laws or other measures in a manner which would constitute a disguised restriction on trade or investment between the parties. So what they're saying there is it would be inappropriate for the United States of America, as an example, to create an environmental law that would act as a, as a restriction on trade or investment between the parties, as a blocking measure, a poison pill, if you will. Well, with all due respect, it's not their place to tell us what we can and cannot do. And once we've agreed to this, we've already agreed that we are recognizing that it's inappropriate to set or use environmental laws or other measures in a manner that would do those things. You see, we're giving up our right. We're waiving our right. It's like going into a, to a police station and saying, I waive my right to, to my Fifth Amendment, and I'm agreeing that I'm going to testify against myself. You can't take it back, folks. It goes through a whole group of general commitments. The parties recognize the importance of mutually supportive trade and environmental policies and practices to improve environmental protection in the furtherances of sustainable development. They do. The parties recognize the sovereign right of each party to establish its own levels of domestic environmental protection and its own environmental priorities and to set, adopt, or modify accordingly its environmental laws or policies. You can't have it both ways, folks. You can't say that the countries have the sovereign right of each party to establish their own levels of domestic environmental protection when in the prior chapter it says, or prior paragraph, it says that you recognize and, you, and that it's inappropriate to use those environmental laws or other, matter, or other laws and, and set them in a way that would, that would enab, enable you to restrict trade. It's crazy. Each party shall strive to ensure that its environmental laws and policies provide for and encourage high levels of environmental protection and shall strive to continue to improve its respective levels of environmental protection. The parties, I'm skipping over four here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to skip over four. No party shall fail to effectively enforce its environmental laws. No party shall fail. In other words, you cannot fail. And there are repercussions and, 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 uh, if you do. No party shall fail to effectively in enforce its environmental laws through a sustained or recurring course of action or inaction in a manner affecting trade or investment between the parties after the date of entry into force of this agreement. Now you say, oh, well, that's just legal language. No, it's not. You see, the word force is used for a reason. Once we've agreed to this, it can be enforced against us. And there are penalties and, and, and repercussions if we don't. Five, the parties recognize that each party retains the right to exercise discretion and to make decisions regarding A, investigatory, prosecutorial, regulatory, and compliance matters and B, the allocation of environmental enforcement resources with respect to other environmental laws determined to have higher priorities. We'll be back in just a moment. Boy, I blew right through that break. I wasn't watching the time. I apologize. All right. I, I probably should have reserved an entire day to do this because I'm only on page four. <laughs> I mean, guys, I want you to understand how terribly dangerous this TPP treaty is. And we're only on page four of one chapter out of 26. The parties recognize that each party retains the right to exercise discretion and to make their own decisions regarding, quote, and listen to the wording here, investigatory, prosecutorial, regulatory, and compliance matters. 
Accordingly, the parties understand that with respect to the enforcement of environmental laws, a party is in compliance with paragraph 4 where a course of action or inaction reflects a reasonable exercise of such discretion or results from a bona fide decision regarding the allocation of resources. You see, they're using legalese to bypass our independent national sovereignty. And what they're saying, essentially, is that <clears throat> while each country will have discretion about how it should apply these things and this and that, you don't have freedom of movement and freedom of action exclusively based upon your national sovereignty. <sighs> Multi lateral environmental agreements. I'm jumping around here. If a party is found to be in non-compliance with its obligations under a multilateral environmental agreement through applicable compliance pr procedures under such agreement, and that non-compliance is in a manner affecting trade or investment between the parties, any other party whose trade or investment is affected and is a party to the same multilateral multilateral environmental agreement may request that the committee be convened to consider the issue by delivering a written request to each national contact point. The committee shall convene to consider whether the matter could benefit from cooperative activities under this agreement with a view to facilitating the relative relevant party coming into compliance with its obligation under the multilateral environmental agreement. Now what that really means is essentially we are placing ourselves under the jurisdiction of the committee. It goes on to say that the Montreal Protocol, the parties recognize that emissions of certain substances can significantly deplete and otherwise modify the ozone layer in a manner which is likely to result in adverse effects on human health and the environment. <clears throat> to that end, each party affirms its commitment to take measures to control the production and consumption of and the trade in sub such substances by implementing its obligations under the Montreal Protocol of Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, including all of its amendments. To be honest with you, I don't even know if we're a signatory to the Montreal Protocol. Maybe one of you out there does. I'm sure we are because we've got the limitation on ozone depleting things. Then it goes to procedural matters. Each party shall promote public awareness of its environmental laws, regulations, and policies, including enforcement and compliance procedures by ensuring that relevant information is available to the public. Okay, so at whose cost? Didn't think of that one, did you? Each party shall ensure that interested persons residing in or established in the territory of that party may, re may request the party's competent authorities to investigate alleged violations of its environmental laws and that the competent authorities shall give such requests due consideration. So that means that states can ask, member states, right, Japan, let's say, could say, we're asking that the treaty members investigate the United States because they're not uh, protecting some little fish in some river in the middle of nowhere. Three, each party, listen to the language, shall ensure, shall means must, it's not optional. Each party shall ensure that judicial, here it comes, quasi-judicial, or an and or administrative proceedings for the enforcement of its environmental laws are available under its law. Okay. Equitable, transparent, and comply with the due process of law. Any hearings of such proceedings shall be open to the public except where the administration of justice otherwise requires. What? So <clears throat> they're opening the door for secret courts and tribunals and administrative hearings where the administration of justice otherwise requires. What would that be? I don't know. It's at the whim of whatever bureaucrat determines, well, we can't have the public hear this and come up with some phony excuse for it. Don't tell me it won't happen. It's happening in everywhere around us in our country right now. Worse, it says that each party shall ensure that judicial, that would be constitutionally judicial, quasi-judicial, which is not, 
You can't have partly judicial. If you have something that is partially judicial, it is unconstitutional. And therefore, an immediate violation of our Constitution. And or an administrative proceeding for the enforcement of environmental law. Okay. First of all, there is no such thing constitutionally as an administrative proceeding. Because every administrative agency operates extra-constitutionally outside the boundaries of the constitutional authority granted to Congress and the federal government and state governments, for that matter. So any administrative agency is already operating without constitutional authority. They are a quasi-judicial entity. Secondarily, it's stating that All of these proceedings must be enforced. You will ensure, you must ensure that that the enforcement of these environmental laws and that these hearings will be open to the public except where the administration of justice otherwise requires. Well, okay, so who makes the decision that the administration of justice requires that these meetings be held in secret? Well, let me put it to you this way. If you trust these people who've already negotiated this treaty for the past five years in secret, pretty much everything is a secret for them from their perspective, isn't it? Here comes the paragraph for loss of national sovereignty. Each party, this is item five, in under procedural matters. Each party shall provide appropriate sanctions or remedies for violations of its environmental laws for the effective enforcement of those laws. Let's hear that again. Each party shall provide appropriate sanctions or remedies for violations of its environmental laws for the effective enforcement of those laws. Quote, such sanctions or remedies may include a right to bring an action against the violator directly seeking damage or injunctive relief or a right to seek governmental action. Okay. So, what that's telling you is that each party, Japan, Brunei, Australia, Canada, Mexico, United States, can, must provide appropriate sanctions or remedies for the violation of their environmental laws. And these sanctions or remedies may include a right to bring an action against the violator directly seeking damages and injunctive relief. So the United States of America, if it violates any of the tenets of this, could be hauled before the tribunal by another member country and effectively charged where the remedy may include damages or injunctive relief. Damages would always incorporates money. And injunctive relief means that we could be ordered based on the determination of some administrative tribunal somewhere we have no control over, they're unelected, they're unaccountable, we don't know who they are, we don't know what country they're determinately from, they have made a decision and determination that they have the right and the authority to to obviate and, and eliminate our Constitution and our own national sovereignty and place us under their jurisdiction where they have the right to enforce against us an injunctive relief that says we must do something or may not do something. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the loss of national sovereignty in a nutshell. Each party shall ensure that in the establishment of sanctions or remedies referred to in the private paragraph, that's the one we just talked about, Appropriate account is taken of relevant factors. These factors may include the nature and the gravity of the violation, the damage to the environment, and any economic benefit the violator derived from the violation. So this, this tribunal can say, okay, the United States has violated some law about wood cutting, and they've cut some tree down that Japan declares to be uh, an endangered species because the Japanese have cut them all down and cooked them for firewood over the course of the last 300 years. They don't have any left, so since we won't give them any, and they're natural here, you know, or some other nonsensical argument. Then the determination by the administrative uh, uh, committee says that the United States is hereby injuncted from removing these trees 
And in addition to that, there's a, there's a financial loss associated with it, and the United States has to pay a fine of how many billions? You see, anytime we make ourselves subject and put ourselves under the jurisdiction of an entity that is not a, a, a member of the United States government itself, whether it's that state or federal, we don't have any alternatives here. We are subjected to their determinations. To make matters worse, by the way, here it comes for pub, in Article uh, 6, Opportunities for Public Participation. This, this particular paragraph kills the Freedom of Information Act. Here's what it says. Each party shall seek, shall seek to accommodate requests for information regarding the party's implementation of this chapter. It doesn't say must. It says shall seek. In other words, they use the word shall, for which is must, right? But shall seek. Seek means make an attempt. It doesn't mean must. And it creates an entire new bureaucracy in subsection 2. Each party shall make use of existing or establish new consultative mechanisms such as national advisory committees to seek views on matters related to the implementation of this chapter. These mechani such mechanisms may compromise persons with relevant experience as appropriate, including experience in business, natural resource conservation and management or other, other environmental matters. Where this goes a little further down the road is they are opening the door for groups like the, concert, the conservancy groups and the, the um, uh, Audubon groups and the Sierra Club to manage and, and, and be the, perf, the, the um, entities that make up these advisory committees. I'll, I, I'd have to explain it to you in greater detail, and I'm not sure we we're going to have the time. I've only got 12 minutes left. But here's my point. They're setting the stage to enable groups, these environmental extremist groups, like the Sierra Club and others, the Nature Conservancy and all of these other pro-environmental extremists, to have control of these committees, to be made up of them, and for them to make the determinations and the rules and the decisions that we are then forced legally to abide by, with criminal, financial, and regulatory penalties associated if we fail. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be under the thumb of the Sierra Club, that's on you. But I'm telling you right now, this is dangerous. Public submissions. There's a section in here under 2E that creates secret courts. Each party shall make its procedures to the receipt and consideration of written submissions readily accessible, etc., 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 but shall not raise issues that are subject of ongoing judicial or administrative proceeding. So what that's saying is, essentially, if the, if this, if the, the issue that, that you want to raise and try to get a public submission or public information about is the subject of an ongoing judicial or administrative proceeding, you're not entitled to any information about it. It's like going to the FBI and saying questioning them and they say, well, I'm sorry, but we can't respond because we're under an, invest an open investigation, which is always the excuse for secrecy. <laughs> Corporate social responsibility. Guess who wrote this chapter? <laughs> Corporate social responsibility. This is Article 8. Each party should encourage enterprises operating with its, within, it, within its territory or jurisdiction to adopt voluntarily into their policies and procedures and practices principles of corporate social responsibility related. I don't want anyone sitting there saying that you are obligated as a, as a, a business to voluntarily yeah, at the point of a gun, adopt these mechanisms. And, and, and the reason why is because when you read what the list is, voluntary mechanisms, including voluntary auditing and reporting, 
of what to whom? All your financial data to go to some unaccountable, unelected bureaucrat somewhere and some committee? Market-based incentives? Voluntary sharing of information and expertise? And public-private partnerships? There's the key word for Agenda 21, folks and that they can contribute to the achievement and maintenance of high levels of environmental protection and complement domestic regulatory measures. That's, I mean, if it's voluntary, that's pretty delineated for a voluntary position that a corporation or an entity or enterprise ought to take. Therefore, in accordance with its domestic laws, policies, or regulations, and to the extent it considers appropriate, each party may incur, or shall encourage, shall, must encourage. So, you see, when you say encourage and must, they're, not, they're mutually exclusive. It's an oxymoron. Encouraging means a voluntary effort. Shall encourage means that you must encourage, at the point of a gun, the following behavior. The use of such flexible and voluntary mechanisms to protect natural resources and the environment in its territory and its relevant authorities, businesses, and business organizations, non-governmental organizations, that's the NGOs out there, the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy, and other interested persons involved in the development of criteria used in evaluating environmental performance with respect to such voluntary mechanisms to continue to develop and improve such criteria. Further, where private sector entities or non-governmental organizations develop voluntary mechanisms. This is, this is essentially the junk science clause. Just like the climate change debacle, they're careful to cover their tracks to eliminate embarrassment with climate gate scandals. Essentially what they're saying here is that these organizations and these relevant authorities are all being forced to cooperate voluntarily and that these environmental extremist groups, including these non-governmental agencies, must take specific action. And in addition to that, further, where these private sector entities or non-governmental organizations develop a voluntary mechanism for the promotion of products based on their environmental qualities, each party should encourage those entities and organizations to develop such mechanisms that, one, are truthful, not misleading or take into account scientific and technical information, and where applicable and available are based on relevant international standards, recommendations, or guidelines and best practices. Okay. Understand, when you hear the terms recommendations, guidelines, and best practices, those are always directly related to junk science. This is the same stuff that's in the Kyoto Protocol, the Montreal Protocols, and all these other environmental agreements, including Agenda 21 out of the UN and the entire UN global climate change agendas. These, what they're saying is that these relevant international standards, recommendations, guidelines, and best practices must be followed. And so this is the equivalent of, and, and honestly, you know, the president may have stated in his State of the Union address that the, the issue of climate gate uh, and, and climate change is confirmed. But let me tell you something. It is not confirmed. It is not obvious. It is not his determination to make. The, guy's got, the guy can't even spell scientific. And I have to tell you, ClimateGate itself proved that the entire climate change issue, not to mention the weather we're having over the past couple of months, is bunk. And even if the science is wrong, we're obligated to live by it. This is insane. I haven't even gotten past chapter seven, a page seven, page seven out of 23 pages. And I can I can shoot this thing so full of holes right now that anybody who would be willing to sign this, including any senator, would be a damn fool. If you would like, please take this subsection, this four, the, these two segments and forward them on to your senator. In fact, Go one step further. If you have contact with him, make him watch it with you or her. The next section goes into cooperation frameworks. And this entire section gives free reign to the environmentalists to call the shots. 
including protecting the environment and promoting, pr promoting sustainable development, utilizing a consensus by the participating parties, which includes non-governmental bodies and organizations and non-parties to the agreement. Did you just hear what that said? So the object is to protect the environment, promotes, promotes sustainable development, but it has to be including consensus by the participating parties. And it, it can include non-government bodies, the Sierra Club, the environmentalists, and organizations, and, quote, non-parties to the agreement. So now we're making ourselves subject to non-nation, non-governmental organizations that have an impact on this agreement. The parties, where possible and appropriate, the parties shall seek to complement and utilize their existing cooperative mechanisms and take into account relevant work of regional and international organizations. So we have to accept their climate arguments. We have to accept their environmental arguments that the, 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 you know, the pinky snail is, uh, there's only eight left on the planet. Then, in t on top of that, we have to create these indoctrination se sessions that we're obligated to participate in. The parties agree that cooperation may be undertaken through modes, such as dialogue, workshops, seminars, conferences, collaborative programs and projects, and technical assistance to promote and facilitate cooperation and training, the sharing of best practices on policies and procedures and exchange of experts. Who's paying for all this? And we are obligated to deal with the best practices and policies and procedures in the exchange of experts who are non-governmental and non-party amendment parties to the agreement, non-parties to the agreement. The parties shall agree on the provision of funds on a voluntary basis to support this operation. There's the question, folks. The parties shall agree on the provision of funds. Whose funds? Where is it coming from? Oh, that's right. You and me, the taxpayer the endless empty pocket that the government constantly has its hand in up until the elbow. Section 9, the, co the funding of cooperative activity shall be decided by the participating parties on a case-by-case -case basis. So here's, the, here's another rub to make things even worse. Assuming for argument's sake that there's, a, there's a, a need for funding of cooperative activities, the parties, the participating parties, including the non-governmental and the non-parties to the agreement, can determine on a case-by-case -case basis who's going to be responsible to pay. And guess who that's going to always be? You guessed it. Us. We're down to the last two minutes. I'm only on page nine. Let me put it to you this way. If, you're, if your senator votes for, the, for this treaty, they need to be removed from office by a recall or any other method possible, short of violence. Short of violence. Any legal method, and I don't care if you've got to make it legal by going and getting a state resolution passed in your state that says we can recall our congressman when they violate the tenets or our senator when they vote for a treaty. Do it. Get a recall amendment through your state right now. We're wrapping for the day. I'm sorry that we ran out of time. Make sure that you visit our friends uh, over at Express uh, Mini Marts 1 and 2. Uh, they are in West Plains, one on the corner of uh, 14 and 63 in Old Granny's Cafe, and also the one that they have straight across the street from the People's Park in West Plains. Make sure you see Jason Henry's law office at number 10 Court Square, 417-256-4100, the Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop over on the square in West Plains, Wits End Classic Barber Shop also on the square in West Plains, uh, the Pizza Hut on Porter Wagoner Boulevard in West Plains. Make sure that you tell each and every one of these friends of ours and our supporters that you heard about them on America's Voice Now and you want to thank them. And last and certainly not least, our friends over at the Battery Station at BatteryStation.com and or 417-257-7799. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. Please join us every day right here. If you'd like more information about this particular topic, Send me an email to mike at americasvoicenow.org and put in the subject line TPP and your TPP segment. I may do another two segments on this another day, and then we'll make one show out of it. Have a great day. God bless.